Welcome to this week's edition of Debriefing the Law. I am Joel Oster. I am Chris Marone. And this week is actually pretty special. I'm taking over from Joel because I just finished his new book, Undo Process. And I spent most of Thanksgiving avoiding my family and reading this book. So <laughs> it gave me a lot of laughs and a lot of time away from Turkey. But I actually is, I wanted to sp- go ahead. That's the point of the book is to drive a wedge between family members. If I have accomplished right. that during the Thanksgiving season, hey, you know what? A job well done. Right. See, now, though, I need Joel to write another book to drive a wedge for the Christmas season, because as we're recording this, I'm kind of freaking out that I might actually have to do something for the Christmas holiday besides start shopping in two days. You don't want to spend time with family over Christmas. That's why God invented football, so you can uh, uh, dodge your family. I am just kidding. I love my in-laws, though I will say (laughs) right now I am recording this podcast downstairs. My wife is upstairs preparing to leave and she's wrapping presents and I'm downstairs talking to you. And so I don't know what that actually says, but Hey, are you ready for Christmas? I I actually, we are ready. Oddly enough this year, my wife's my wife's Hawaiian for those at home and we've got the Hawaiian family in. So right now um, I'm, uh, sequestered away in our like back bedroom of the house, sitting on a wing back chair recording this because they're having a full on Hawaiian concert, ukuleles, harmonicas, halal. People are doing the doing the hula, the whole nine yards in my front room. You have got to do Christmas at your in laws. If she is from Hawaii, what oh, are yeah. you doing in Arizona? There's a huge like Pacific Islander contingent in Arizona and Utah. It's absolutely bad. I didn't know. I didn't know until I married in. Wow. And all of a sudden, like I show up and there's like 60 relatives that are all like, you know, calling me a hapa holly and and saying all these things. And we're (laughs) in the middle of Arizona. And I'm like, okay, okay, I can do this. I can. There's there's a lot of Hawaiian people here. Let's get this going. So do you do you get to go to Hawaii to visit your in laws? Um. Not since COVID, right? COVID put a kibosh on that. But my um, my sister in law and her husband own um, a house on the Big Island, and my in laws, my and it's my wife's grandparents. They still have um, land just south of Hilo on the Big Island in Kiana'u and um, Lalani Estates, which was very popular in the news a couple years back when the volcano erupted in Hawaii and decimated the whole area. That's the area where my wife's family lives. Well, next time you go to Hawaii, you're in you're in Maui, and you're on the beach there. You can pull out my book, and Indeed. it will definitely entertain you as compared to all of the boring, <laughs> mundane sites that of otherwise course. would be Maui. But I, of course, I'm just kidding on that. But hey, thank you so much for reading that book. Uh, and, and so, what what were your thoughts? Did you like the cartoons? Oh my gosh, the book was hilarious. I found myself constantly chuckling to myself i love i love a good political cartoon i love um i actually really enjoyed a lot of the tie into your cases it reminded me a lot of the cle's that you do so it was just a super fun time to just be able to go through this and just kind of have a good you know a good chuckle every once in a while but then read about some pretty you know amazing cases and how the american judicial system has kind of shaped itself over the past couple hundred years my i have to admit it's always been kind of my secret fantasy to do Political cartoons. I don't know, but Ooh. even as a little kid, I would love getting the the daily newspaper. Now there is something that we've lost in our society. We really have. I used to love getting up, going out, getting the newspaper, opening up, and reading the comics right away. And I aspire to being a, a Charles Schultz or whoever writes Heathcliff or Calvin and Hobbes, the most yeah. amazing cartoon out there. Doonesbury. And so now I got to with uh, the help of a uh, Brooke. So Brooke is my marketing person, Brooke Bolton. She does an amazing, amazing job. She is actually the artist for those cartoons. If it, if I were doing oh. it, it would be stick figures. It's kind of hard to, oh, for sure. to color in stick figures, but she she actually drew them. So working together is a lot of fun to create a lot of those cartoons. And it gives people the ability to actually color if you don't like to, you know, actually read the book. You can just color in the pictures. Night. Well, I actually my favorite one, and I had it marked in the book, is uh, the the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She's lifting up the weights, and it's called the bench slap. And I was like dying when I was right. reading through. It. And I mean, it's it's towards the end of the book, and I just was like, I saw that one, and I just started laughing. And my wife was like, "What's going on?" I'm like, you just don't, you wouldn't understand. Like, I got to set the stage and go go back to eating turkey. 
This is this is my time. This is now when I was researching for this book and I learned about RBG's workout regime, and I got to tell you, I was floored. So that's one of the benefits of learning all about the Supreme Court justices. But she actually has you can Google it the RBG workout, and she was doing planks and push ups all the way up until the end. And so, uh, hey, she puts how many of us do planks and push ups every single day? But hey, it's good for RBG. It was. And if I remember correctly, her personal trainer was one of like the honored guests at her funeral. It was one of her like closest like confidants and friends really? outside of her outside of her law clerks. It was her personal trainer. It was the same guy for like the past 12 years that did workouts with RBG. And I remember he gave a interview. I want to say it was it was either CBS or, or NBC. It wasn't one of the like political networks. And he just talked about like the, the, the life that he had with RBG and he was severely like choked up and like on the t- verge of tears about their friendship and how he never thought he would wow. find such a friendship in a 80 year old Supreme court justice. How much fun would that be? So Chris, I just, for the first time in my life, started using a personal trainer and we were at the gym there and he Mm -hmm. has helped me do all my workouts. And part of his job is to really crack that whip. Like, Hey, get to it. Don't be a wimp. Don't be a wuss. I want to see you do these arm curls here. Now let's do the the back flies or whatever. Can you imagine being a personal trainer for RBG and cracking the whip with her? That would be, that'd be very intimidating. I'm not sure I could do that. Right. Well, and man, like anytime you're talking like truth to power to someone who has that like that amount of power, it's right. like it's got to be humbling. Right. When you're like, no, you're not doing that right. And she kind of looks like looking at you like that RBG side eye that she would give every once in a while to like Roberts or Alito. <laughs> right. Right. And and have and have the personal trainer be like, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, your honor. Like I didn't hold the plank for five more seconds or not or do whatever you want. Do, uh, right. Right. You be you. You be you. How would he start this off? Would he start it off by saying, may it please the court, I want to see 15 <laughs> burpees. I mean, how would like, he actually address her? But uh, Could, you, uh, could uh, you see him on a basketball court and be like, Ruth, we're pleasing the court. Drop and give me 50. <laughs> that's right. Oh, that'd be that'd be great power. I'm sure a lot of litigants would have loved to have been in that position. And so that's oh, interesting. Sure. He spoke at her funeral. He did. He did. But it was yeah it was great but i'm circling back to the book because there's so much to get into and i want to do it but but why write this joel why did you decide to to put this out uh you know this year well several years ago i made the stupid decision actually it was one of the greatest decisions i ever made to (laughs) quit my job which was i was a senior litigation counsel at a large nonprofit law firm and you know you, you that's kind of a nice cushy position, if you will. We've had a couple of cases at the U.S. Supreme Court uh, while I was there. And I decided now is a good time to leave that gig, go out on my own, and teach CLEs using comedy. And uh, I, I, my wife said, should you get your sanity levels checked there? I'm not sure that's actually the most sane thing you have done. It was kind of my passion. And Chris, what right. I learned is I got to go coast to coast meeting lawyers from all over this country and I'm telling you, the stories that I learned were amazing. amazing. I, thought, I, I thought I knew some fun stories before this, but you you actually get to hear them from these lawyers. I cannot wait till COVID passes so I can get back out there on the road again. So this was kind of my opportunity to just write down a, a collection of all the stories that I've heard from lawyers over the last couple of years. You're going to have to do like a second edition of just Zoom stories. Just talking to lawyers about people coming in on Zoom, not muting themselves, inappropriate. Like we've seen a couple of them over the years, right? The we've seen some of the the better ones, but there's got to be more out there. Courts and people incriminating well, themselves, I'm, all that stuff. The most famous one in the world of law, of course, would have to be Flushgate. I assume you're familiar with Flushgate that happened last I year am. at the Supreme Court, where Justice Breyer. It's assumed that it was Justice Breyer. He never owned up to it flushed the toilet during a zoom oral argument right and um yeah it became a flush gate chris have have you been bitten by the zoom i have i i have been bitten by the zoom a couple i have been on the receiving end and the giving end of being what what, what was your story (laughs) so um i was well gosh there was a couple of them one was um i had the name change. We had a um, bingo night with a paralegal organization I do work with, and I had Maroni Pony as my bingo name. 
Okay. So when I logged in the next day with my meeting with the governor's office, with the governor's okay. chief of staff, the attorney general for um, Arizona, and um, our local couple of uh, representatives, they logged in, and I didn't re- – because I just put on my computer and I walked away real quick. So I was there early for the meeting, and it was Maroney Pony. And then when I turned on I my back – when I turned on my background, it was the back. The background of it was somebody had um, photoshopped my face onto a unicorn's body. I love so, it. Yeah. So that. So so now the attorney general, the who's now running for senate here in Arizona, knows me as Maroney Pony. Hey, Brooke, if you are listening here, making show notes, I want this <laughs> mar- this podcast marketed as Joel Oster with. The Maroney Pony. The Maroney Pony. Pony. Hey, that is a great gym there. That, 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 that's gold. That solid, solid gold. Um, I've, I've had one where um, there has been wardrobe malfunctions because of my dog. Um, okay. My dog has thrown up on me during a Zoom call. She jumped up on, and I have a 62 pound pit bull just for the visitors at home. I don't have a wow. lap dog. I have a 62 okay. pound pit bull that during COVID, she. Uh, jumped up on my thing and I was trying to push her down and it was just during a staff meeting. So it wasn't like a, a super important meeting. So I could kind of push her down and be things. And then she just yacked on me on the computer, the whole nine yards. <laughs> wow. Yeah. There's some amazing stories. I will have to have an addendum there on a zoom oh, yeah. of failures. The one that happened to me wasn't as good as Maroney pony, but I was well, doing a mediation and uh, you know how a mediation whenever you, you when you're dressed you're dressed appropriately from the waist Correct. up the waist bottom <laughs> you're Basketball lucky shorts. to be wearing anything waist bottom uh, yep. waist down and so there I am and I'm on court I'm on Zoom and I'm dressed appropriately from the waist up and I decided to cross my legs and there of course you can see the pictures on the Zoom call the the screen yep. so there I see my bald naked knee there for everyone <laughs> to see. I cannot take it down fast enough. I hope no one saw that, but that's that was my uh, faux pas, if you will. I love it. I absolutely love it. So, and you know, that's that's you know one of the great things about this book is that you've gotten so many great stories in 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 packed into the hundred plus pages in there. But what's your what's your favorite one of all the stories that were in the book? What's your absolute favorite one of a lawyer gone wild? I got uh, probably the the one I led the book off with. I, I loved it so much. I had to put it right up there at the front. Oh, yeah. and, and there's a lot of good stories. In fact, there's a lot of good stories that didn't make it on the book. Well, number one, I wanted to keep this PG 13. Uh, and so I kept some of those stories out, but my favorite one was probably the very first a story where you had this guy who, um, basically went AWOL uh, yeah. from, from his world, from his life. Uh, he was living there in an Ohio town, went AWOL. He owed, I think, $30,000 in back child support. So he took off, and his the, his ex-wife could not find him, so she had him declared dead. dead and my yeah. first thought was, how many of us would love to have someone declared dead? I mean, that's kind of a nice power to have if you can Indeed. get that power. Well, what happened was after about, I don't know, several years passed, he shows back up in town. And so I'm sure I would have loved to see that conversation with his parents. Hey, Donny boy, so glad to see you. Before you come over for Thanksgiving dinner, you might want to know, we gave away your room and had you declared dead. It's like, you might want right. to know, so we had no awkward conversations. Well, it turns out it's kind of hard to live life as a dead person, for example. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, uh, yeah he went to the DMV to get a driver's license. And they frowned upon dead people driving cars there in that Ohio town. They weren't woke to the whole vampire community, whatever. And, and so he goes to court to and he files a motion to undo this death certificate. Now, Chris, my take on this is, have you ever heard of a more slam dunk matter ever before court? I mean, no. think, have you ever had any issue in court where you had more solid proof than what Donald Eugene Miller had on that day? No, that is the, like, the epitome of open and shut. Yeah, it's like, okay, the matter before the court today is, is Donald Gene Miller alive? Hey, Donald, uh, Mr. Miller, what <laughs> evidence do you have that you actually are alive? It's like, hey, you see my, my uh, Hi guys. Uh, fit? Right here. <laughs> Wave at the court. <laughs> right. I'm That's breathing. Right. I'm breathing. My Fitbit said I got a thousand steps in today. Would the would Fitbit be wrong? I don't think so. I got my. St- Someone had to get those steps. Well, the court said, "Hey, we appreciate all the briefing here. Good job. Uh, we reviewed the matter. 
But unfortunately, I'm going to have, going to, have to deny your motion. Still you dead. see, Donnie, you filed it out of time. There's a three-year statute of limitations period there to file these motions under the death certificate. He filed it out of time, and so the court delay, or denied his motion. So to me, that was like a crazy story of where the law, I guess, was correct and how it was applied. Right. But wow, that had to be a real interesting legal anomaly. I mean, how would you, Chris, how would you advise someone to go about living their life as a dead person? Have, have you ever thought about that? I, well, I mean, there's a couple of good things right off the bat. I never have to pay taxes again. I don't think dead people have to pay taxes, do dead they? Dead people don't know. But, but I could still vote in places like Chicago. That's right. I mean, there's there's that. Uh, well, I mean, how, I, you you can't like in this day and age. I guess you know because the case didn't take place in 2010. So if we look if we look back to to today's day and age, it would be incredibly I would say easier to find side hustle work to to be able to support yourself than it was back when he was figuring it out. Right, right. And, but and, what if he committed a crime? You were you right. were a defense lawyer. And the the punishment was life in jail. Would you tell tell your client, "All right, good, you're free to go." Yeah, you're dead. It doesn't matter. No, I'm that's pretty right. sure the that's when that's when the court would be like, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa! No, 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 you're still alive. You get <laughs> you get none of the benefits and all of the punishments of being dead." And this is one of the beauty of these cases. I actually then found some other lawyer sent me another follow up case to that, where it was in Ohio, uh, or I'm sorry, Iowa. I love and Ohio. there was a prisoner Iowa. in Iowa okay. who died in prison. I mean, his heart stopped. Yeah. They had to resuscitate him five times. He actually had died. They had to bring him back to life. Well, Your life sentence is over. Sure. Exactly. It's That's over. What his, his attorneys argued he should be a free man. He was only sentenced to one life sentence, and now he's on his multiple life, whatever you call that. And so, right. yeah, he asked to be free. And this is where lawyer jokes come from, right? Because straight <laughs> right. face lawyer. One of my absolute favorite cases that I ever tried in my entire life is I had a guy low level picked up for misdemeanor marijuana possession when marijuana was illegal in California. And they picked him up because they thought he was in possession. He had several what's considered dime bags. That's how you divide up um marijuana and they said well you know you have about 30 dime bags here so we're also going to charge you with intent for sale and literally okay. joel my argument was because medicinal marijuana was legal not recreational marijuana okay. so my argument was that that was my client's pillbox he had it broken up into daily uses so that way okay. he didn't overuse and overdose for marijuana nice A little pillbox right? Judge laughed me out of court. Absolutely was like, <laughs> that is the dumbest thing I have ever heard. But you have to come up with these creative arguments to try to get your clients out of jail or out of serving time. Like, I thought it was genius. My boss thought it was genius. My client thought it was idiotic, but he was also the one caught with the marijuana. So that's his own right. problem. But right. I, the prosecutor, like, afterwards was like, I had to hold my breath from laughing because of the argument that you put forth. And I was legit, like, serious about it. Like, no, this is, my client does not want to overdose. The the amount in the dime bag, that is what he uses per day. This is, this is medicine, people. This is not street-level selling of marijuana. And, no, completely lost that argument. But it was made, that, and it was there. That is discrimination against A personalities. These people who like right. to be organized with their life, they're right. being now being punished for it, Chris. You will now be a chapter in my next book. But I hey, that, that's a great ex great example and a great story there. Uh, well, sometimes the law is crazy. Right. It, and you know what? That's just that's how the law works sometimes, right? We're going to talk a little bit later about this Colorado case, but that's how the law works. Sometimes it's no common sense or it's all common sense or it's outside influences. It's absolutely not so crazy, but you know, and you know, you get these stories that people are sending you because we want to tell them, right? We want to, you know, I just told you my marijuana story. We want to tell the stories and because I want be more stories. Yes. Yeah. I, I want more stories. So we're, we're doing this podcast for a couple of reasons. One, I want to get the word out about the book, but right. then number two, and this probably is more important. I want more stories. Yeah. So if you know of a crazy story involving a lawyer, our lawyers gone wild section, it will be updated every year. So I want to hear your stories about a lawyer's gone wild. Right. Well, and you know, what's funny is that 
this book isn't for just lawyers as well. It's for everybody, everybody to read. And I, and I saw that your son, Zach helped you out. How did, how did that come about? How did that go? Well, Zach, I, uh, he was, he graduated valedictorian from his high school class. And so I was there listening no to his valedictorian speech and I'm telling you, he just cracked me up. He told it an incredible joke, and I I would butcher it right now. I have it on recording, so maybe one of these days I'll actually play it. The <laughs> entire audience just erupted in laughter, and I thought, okay, wow, my son is, is funny. Now, I think he would make the most incredible lawyer if he chose to go that route. Right now, he's right. in engineering school, uh, but he is he's the most he is probably one of the funnier people that I know. And he is incredible with his grammar. And so I said, hey, Zach, what are you doing this summer? Will you help me do some research in writing this book? And so he wrote a lot of incredible, funny chapters. I don't want to tell you which chapter he wrote, because you'll probably say, <laughs> why well, read Joel's stuff? I'll just read Zach's stuff in the Only future, Zach. which probably not a bad idea. But I'll tell you what, it was a lot of fun. I really did enjoy working with Zach. Sometimes he can be kind of hard-nosed, but hey, that's what sons are good for with their, right. their dads, I guess. And I, I would say I'll pay him back on the tennis court or on the ping pong table, but no, they're, they're actually, I'm running out of uh, venues to actually get my son back at, so I'll just, uh, uh, I'll take the good-natured ribbing as he delivers it. You'll beat him at like an all-you-can-eat buffet you might be able to take him down at like senior night at the bingo hall. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's places we'll find for you, Joel. There, you pickleball. Pickleball is huge in Arizona. You could probably take him at that. No, no, no. He, he'll take nope. me in pickleball. It's still uh, taking down. <laughs> You, you gotta understand, we're, we're tennis players, and, right. and so we we love playing pickleball. And uh, so we go out there and we'll play on a, on a regular basis. There's some uh, pickleball courts here; it is huge here in Kansas City as well. Oh yeah. Uh, don't get me started on that. I'll tell you off the air about a horrible story last week where we missed our opportunity to play pickleball with the in-laws. We are looking Ooh. forward to it. Uh, you gotta understand, my son and I both play tennis. We both play pickleball. We're pretty good oh, with yeah. the rackets. This would be a great time to play a sport with the in-laws and we did not get our chance, but nonetheless, as is life as is life. So, but let's, let's circle back a little bit to the book here. Cause there's some, there's some stuff I want to hit and I know we got limited time, but we've talked about it on the podcast before that certain legal institutions are premised on the idea of, of essentially a lie. Like could, let, let's talk about this some more because you and I being lawyers and being classically trained in this understand that there's the legal world, that exists outside of what normal truth and, and, and lies are, but how would it, how, how can we get this out to the non-lawyers out there? And, and why is it important to know? Yeah, I, I, I was trying to research and dig into this thought of why are there lawyer jokes out there? You know, right. everyone has their favorite lawyer joke. You know, you right. go to someone, oh, your lawyer, have you heard this one? Yes, I probably oh, yeah. have. Everyone has their yes. favorite lawyer joke. And Chris, I did some research. And back in 1850, during honest Ab during the Civil War era, there were lawyer jokes. Uh, even Abe Lincoln had told one. So you go back 150 years, 170 years, they were making fun of lawyers. I did some more research back in William Shakespeare's day in Henry VI. As Shakespeare yep. wrote this line. The first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. And I bet the audiences were in stitches. Oh, yeah, kill all the lawyers. What a great idea. They have been making fun of lawyers for centuries. Right. I wanted to know why. And so I started doing some digging. And here's why it, it dawned on me. I think there are some institutions in the legal practice, in the legal profession, things that we do that we would consider these are pillars to the practice of law. And I right. think that those pillars, if you will, the regular world sees them as lies, as lying. And the first one I want to throw by you is the plea. Chris, I am. let's have a little bit of an argument here. Well, let's do this. I am going to suggest that the plea, how, how the normal criminal justice system starts with a plea, right? the real world considers that a lie. 100%. What do you say? You agree with that? Well, for argument's sake, I'm going to say, well, I'll take the side that a plea is not a lie, and I want you to prove to me that it is a lie. Okay. All right. So, yeah. The, the, how does the criminal defendant plead nine times out of ten? It doesn't matter how mm -hmm. guilty he is. He could have put on his Facebook status the night before, hey, check out this car chase. It's epic, bro. That's me mm -hmm. and the cop. I'm dusting him. It doesn't matter. He pleads. Right. Not guilty. I mean, heck, he could have, uh, you know, uh, he could have got a thousand likes for the orange and black 
crotch right. rocket, and he's on trial for stealing an orange and black crotch rocket. It doesn't matter. He pleads not guilty. Chris, I'm going to suggest that kind of nuancing with words and the truth would never fly at home. Imagine this, Chris. Would this, would this ever work with mom? Okay. Let's say uh, uh, there's mud on, on the carpet, and, mm-hmm. and the mother goes to the son and says, Son, did you drag mud in on the floor? And the son looks at his mom and says, Mom, hmm. Not guilty. Before I answer that, can I um, can I see what evidence you have? No. <laughs> mom wants to know if you did it. Did you do it or did you not do it? Mom will not take a plea of not guilty and make her prove the case. Uh, and let's say the son said, Mom. <laughs> or your could wife. I have a yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I have a change of venue before grandma? <laughs> no, mom does not care about your due process rights, right? Did you do not it or did you not do it? A plea of not guilty, which means I want you to prove that I did it, mom, would never fly in the real world. Now, Chris, I already know what you're thinking. I, I've heard it from several lawyers. This is what right. you're thinking. You say, Joel, not guilty doesn't actually mean not guilty. And Chris, you probably can say that with a straight face because you are a lawyer. You are trained in how to do word and nuancing like that. Right. I looked up the words. But so here, here's how that thought goes. Look, Jill, in our criminal justice system, that's how the game is played. You, you say not guilty, and mm-hmm. you just simply mean the prosecution hasn't proved their case yet. Right. Let's make the prosecution prove their case. Right. Right. Is, is that kind of what you're thinking? Well, of course. All right, so I, I, I looked it up, and if you look up Webster's Dictionary, guilty means you're culpable of the act in question, you did it. Not would be the opposite of that. So not guilty by its very terms means you didn't do it. So I think a plea of not guilty, when you, you're as guilty as sin, is it's dishonest. Any, any thoughts? Well, I, I keep flashing back, as you said that, to the Bill Clinton impeachment trial, where he sits right. there and he goes, it's the definition of is, is. What is right. the definition of is? So we go back and go, well, what is the definition of not guilty for this specific context? And as, as trained lawyers that are way too much money in debt for this degree, we know that it's nuanced when you're procedural Right. You're, you're having a procedural discussion. I'm saying yes. that you haven't proven your case yet. I'm not guilty by um, constitutional standards. I may be guilty of sin, which could be true. I, I could or I could be guilty of a different crime. Who knows? But I'm saying when I say not guilty, I'm saying the prosecution, I'm going to make the prosecution earn it. That's what I'm saying at the end of the day. And my take, my response to that is twofold. One, that's not how the real world understands those terms. When you say not, not guilty, right. you mean you're not guilty. Not that right. you haven't proven your case yet. Let the games begin. Chris, well, that's what we're saying. Well, yeah. Why don't we just have a starter's pistol? Ooh, that'd be, f- well, because you can't have guns in a courtroom. <laughs> okay, there you go. A there clapper go. then. The <laughs> starter clap. See the judge up, like Judge Judy, like, let's go. Exactly. That would be more honest than a plea of not guilty when you're as guilty as a sin. I'm thinking of the Jesse Smollett case that just finished here a couple weeks ago. We all knew he was as guilty as sin. He did it. He he falsified this. uh, When he pled not guilty, no, you are lying. That's what you were doing. You were lying to the court. If you lie to mom, not only did you get your punishment was due you, it's doubled, and now you lose your Wi-Fi to boot for the week. That's what should happen in court. This should double your punishment whenever right. you pled not guilty and were later found to be guilty. You know, when I was working in a public defender's office, you know, in my first years of practicing law, um, it was standard. You say not guilty so you can move because we would have, you know, we were in Monterey County, California, and right. I would probably have 80 to 90 or 100 arraignments at 8 15 a.m. and I had a hundred pretrial conference at 9 a.m. So to be able to blow through these hundred things, you just say not guilty and you hold them and schedule for a pretrial and you kick right. the can down the line. It essentially became like saying, let's just continue until later. But we just it was easier, right? We became lazy in the how do you plead not guilty? Okay, we're getting on the record, we're getting everything going and pushing around. So every once in a while, you know, you gotta mix it up and throw in a guilty and see if somebody's paying attention. <laughs> See, normal operating procedures, you just plead not guilty and you move right. on. 
Even though you're wearing the victim's Rolex in court, it doesn't Indeed. matter. You just played not oh guilty. Oh, my gosh. What was that video? Oh, I can't remember it now, but he was wearing a Miami Dolphins jersey. And they say, oh, you're here for larceny of a Miami Dolphins jersey. And they're like, how do you plead? And he's like, <laughs> not guilty, your honor. And he's like sitting there in the Dan Marino jersey. Oh, I got to find that clip. That gotta, is a oh. great clip for my next edition. Oh, for sure. For sure. So, but I mean, but we see that as legal institutions, you know, what, what's going on and, and, and that, that kind of circles back to is we also clients also ask us or people ask us, would you lie for them? Right. 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 And so, so has anybody ever asked? I mean, I've gotten asked that a ton, right? Criminal defense attorney, people ask me that every day, but if someone asked they actually you, ask Joe? you that they, 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 during your sessions uh, with the, with the, the, the defendant, right. will, the, will the client actually ask you, Hey, can you lie for me? They don't like blatantly go, Hey, Chris lie for me. What they say is like, yeah, I did it, but you know, we're going to, I'm going to plead not guilty because you know, the, I, that wasn't me on the videotape or the cops didn't, you know, blah, 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 blah. They think they're smarter right. than the cops. So you get asked that. That's one of the things as a public defender or criminal defense attorney is you don't want the client to tell you whether or not they did it. You don't like, you just want to start mounting a defense. You don't want to get into the, the sharp weeds. Now, Clients that perfuse innocence, which is I, I've experienced, I some I, I believe them. I've had some clients perfuse innocence, and I'm like, I'm looking at the tape of you at the 7-Eleven waving right. into the camera. Right. Like, th look, there's the same <laughs> tattoo on your face, same scar, but you're wearing the same hoodie. Like, right. <laughs> you you walk <laughs> off cam like you don't even walk off camera into police custody. Like you're not innocent. We're seeing this. And they'll be like, yes, nah, dog, yes. nah, I'm innocent. And I'm like, come on, come the F on, man. You know you're not innocent. Right, right, right. Yeah, I've had conversations with clients where it's been an awkward dance. Like, we're preparing for a deposition, and there's a real critical issue. And I know they're kind of dancing around. No one has actually asked me out and out, hey, can't we just say that the opposite of what actually right. happened? I mean, who's going to know? No one's had the balls to say that to me. But they dance all around. It's like, Good. well... How should we respond here? Could I say it like this or whatever? So they dance all around it. But I do these men on the street interviews where I actually ask the people on the street that question and the responses yeah. that I've gotten are absolutely hilarious. Uh, a lot of them say, well, of course, your lawyer should lie for you. That's why you pay them. You should pay them more for bigger lies. And so it's right. interesting to get the public's perspective. They just assume that lawyers will lie for you when in reality, when you get to that, that moment in your, your counseling of a client, they, they kind of dance around. I have found that clients are kind of uneasy asking you to lie. Right. They just, but they, they assume you're supposed to lie for them. They right. just don't know how to ask for it. Right. And it's, and it's, it's scary to think that that's the perception of lawyers in society. They're going to get up right. there and say whatever they can to get me off because my cousin got off or, you know, OJ right. got off or Casey Anthony got off or who like, it's like, no man, like, it's more nuanced than that. And that leads actually perfectly into my actual favorite section of the book where it's, it's time to get a new lawyer. When your client lies, <laughs> it's time to get it. So how did you come up with these stories from here? Oh, I, I want to get some response from our listeners about new ideas. This is the premise of this section. Right. It's time to get a new lawyer win. Now this thought dawned on me with Donald Trump. You remember Donald Trump and I his do. interactions with his former lawyer, uh, Michael Cohen. And I believe or Rudy, on the evening or with Rudy news, Giuliani. I mean, we can <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, I remember with uh, with Rudy, um, with, with Michael Cohen, it came out on the evening news that his law offices were raided and they confiscated nice. all these audio tapes where Michael Cohen had secretly recorded his conversations with Donald Trump back at his law office. And I'm thinking, okay, if I were Donald Trump, I would take that as a sign. It's time to get a new yep. lawyer. You're right. I'm sitting there waiting my dinner, and, uh, and I, oh, what? My lawyer was secretly recorded my conversations. This is not a positive development. So that just got my mind going down this track. Also, here's also another true story. I was talking to this one lawyer. Uh, I got to say this carefully because I don't want to divulge where this person was, but nonetheless, uh, he was telling me how he represented this person okay. on a, um, I'm sorry, I have the story backwards. This was a lawyer who hired another lawyer for her divorce case. Okay. And so at the end of the divorce case, 
right when the case was over, the uh, her lawyer asked if it was okay if he touched her, whatever you want to call it. Uh, oh. You know, an inappropriate hmm. touching there. Okay. Right at counsel's table. And I thought, okay, that might be a sign. So I think how I said it in the book is, you know, when when your um when your lawyer asked to touch your breasts, and you're a guy, it might be time to get a new lawyer Indeed. and get a new personal trainer while you're at it. So I kind of mm. changed it up a little bit. It wasn't actually a guy in the original story. No, but that's nice. That's a nice. I I like that little touch. I there's been a couple times where you you need a new lawyer when I'm looking across. You know, I I I, I sat second chair for a trial. A few years back, uh, I helped with um, voir dire, witness uh, prep and all this stuff. And I looked over at the first chair and I'm like, it's it's time for us to leave. Like, it's time. It's it's time for. And, and I advised the client. I'm like, look, I'm independent. Account. I'm like, you need to find a new first chair. You you really you really do. Essentially, if you remember the part in my cousin Vinny where they had the two lawyers right. and the one guy was stuttering through all the questions, but all the yes. questions were asinine. Um, yes. It was this guy without the stuttering. It was just okay. asinine. And it was in what he was asking questions were constantly affirming the fact that our guy was guilty. He wasn't okay. asked. And so it, it was kind of bad, but the guy came back and he sat down and he shot the biggest double thumbs up to our client and then like <laughs> cabbage patched it around to the prosecuting attorney. And I'm like, oh, we got to go. It's game over. No, no, no. Wow. But your honor, yeah, no, we're done for today. Like, let's let's figure this out. Luckily, the guy took my advice and got another attorney. I subsequently lost a job because I wasn't brought back as second chair. But smartest thing he could do was get a new uh, first chair primary counsel because this yes. guy was just going to he was going to go to jail for a long time. Good call. Good call. Right. Hey, another one that actually is loosely based on a true story uh, was this. Uh, a, a lawyer lawyer told me the situation that happened to a friend of theirs where the person was on their way to court that morning. So they had court uh, for their trial. And um, and the, the client decided to get an Uber driver uh, to take them to court. Their lawyer showed up as their Uber driver. And I thought, <laughs> Chris... Yes. That's a bad sign. When you, you get, when you call to get Uber and your lawyer shows up as your Uber driver, it might be time to get a new lawyer. I wonder if anything said in that car was protected under law, lawyer client confidentiality it, because he wasn't acting as his lawyer at the time. It, it should be. Uh, you know what? Uh, yeah. Maybe a, 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 this is a whole new a class. Dual role there. What oh, role were you? We, all right. Can you exactly build him? So. Do you get to build him for that Uber? Not only do you get paid for the Uber drive, but can you bill him that hour that it would take in the Uber? Look, oh my gosh, all the ethical dilemmas are popping into my head. But that's an ethical violation. You can't charge for both. If you're charging to be an Uber driver, you can't also then charge for legal advice at the same time. That's a double dipping. Yeah, but let's see how the court decides because not only do you make fun of lawyers in this book and we have a lot of funny stories about that but you take some pretty good hits at the supreme court at some judges you know who do, who do you think right now is the funniest supreme court justice currently sitting? i am gonna go not historically it, it has to be scalia you cannot get better oh, than scalia can't. scalia has yep. so many classic lines now it's also an interesting study chris to say this why do these justices get laughter a laughter response is it because they told a real good funny joke that would work no in open mic night at the local, nope. local comedy club no or is it because of the unequal positions of power so the yes. justices are sitting up high they are ruling over you so you had that tension and they kind of point out that you are peons compared to them yep and there's some nervous laughter in the courtroom so what is it uh, I'm gonna go with Gorsuch right now. I think Gorsuch right now is the funniest on the bench. Uh, he is funny. Uh, now it's been a rough two years when we've had Zoom trial. You really can't get the response from the people, uh, you know, because there's not a live audience. But right. I, I think he's gonna be this, the funniest justice once we get back. He did recently, though. I will tell you this: in, in open court, he tried to impersonate a Kansas lawyer by doing impersonations. That that, <laughs> that is odd. Right. Yeah. That's odd for a Supreme Court justice to try to elicit laughter by doing impersonations from the bench. He did it. But here's the, here's the funny thing about that, Chris. 
he messed up. And he impersonated a New York lawyer, Ooh. trying to impersonate a Kansas, uh, or a New York police officer when he's trying to impersonate a Kansas City police officer. And the lawyer was so quick, <laughs> the lawyer caught him on and said, uh, this is a Kansas police officer, not a New York police officer, to which oh, Robert, gosh. to which Gorsuch said, touche, touche, you got me on that one. Because <laughs> the accents are so much alike, right? Oh, yeah, exactly. exactly. Ute. No, we call it yeah. youth here Ute. in the Midwest, not a ute. <laughs> we call them these two utes. I'm sorry, what? That's right. <laughs> that, and you know, I think I always loved the personality that it, Scalia wasn't my cup of tea, right? I, I didn't agree a lot with Scalia's opinions, and, and that's to be expected. But he was, he had some comedic chops to him. I also thought like the stone faced like just pure silence of Clarence Thomas was hilarious to me. Like yeah. just like the they silent would like look, justice. Right. It, like it was times where like or Ruth, Ruth would, you know, Justice Ginsburg would make a joke or even Justice Kennedy would try to make like a comment and he would just sit there like <clears throat> stonewall, like no emotion. I thought that was hilarious. I always found that to be super funny when other justices were kind of ribbing each other back and forth and he was sitting there like, like your grandpa, like, do I really right, have to right. be here for this right now? Like, can we not? Yeah. Can we not? Is he awake over there? Is he awake? Yeah. So yeah, Thomas is one of my f- favorite justices. I will point out that now oh, he is Chatty to- Carl from the bench. Pre-COVID, oh, he, he never asked a question. I mean, he was no. he was notorious for his silence. And during COVID, when they did things via Zoom, they changed up the rules so each justice was given their allotment to ask questions and. Uh, you based it upon seniority, so he went second right after the chief, right. and so he would ask his questions right out of the gate. Mm-hmm. Well, now that they're back in live session, he has continued with that practice, and he is still asking questions from the bench. So apparently, Good. he's found his tongue, and uh, and he he's continuing to ask Good for questions. Him. Good for him. And so, and I mean, the book is is super fun. There's such great stories, but like, you then you then take a turn for a little bit of the serious notes, right? And I think that's important. We need to understand and law is, but you, you come in with, you know, Korematsu and Dred Scott, Buck v. Bell and, and some horrible, horrible decisions. You know, why'd you make the turn? Well, I thought so when I was writing this book, I, you sometimes when you write a book, you don't know where it's going. Right. You, you're writing stuff down. You're just kind you're of just following your, your heart. And, and as your mind is, is, is leading you in a certain path. And, and then, but you don't really know how the book is going to end. Well, as I'm writing these stories, this question hit me. Why? What do we make of the fact that the law is so failed and flawed at different turns? Right. And there's a, I think there's a real freeing thing when you realize the law doesn't always get it right. And right. those are perfect examples of where the Supreme Court, the highest law of our land, who they are supposed to be legal experts. They are trained in the law. They're supposed to be probably the best rendition of lawyers America has to offer. That's why they're sitting on the high court. They totally got it wrong. I mean, the case you just mentioned, the Dred v. Scott, often considered the worst Supreme Court decision of all time, yep. saying African-Americans aren't even people under the Constitution. Yep. Uh, you got Buck v. Bell, where... Oliver Wendell Holmes said, is it one generation of imbeciles enough? We should allow for these people to sterilize, you know, uh, as he said, imbeciles. Yep. Um, horrible decisions there. What do we make of that? That the highest court in our land got it so wrong. That is what the book is really about. And that's what we hope to conclude by the end of the book. Well, and I think it's an important discussion that the law isn't an absolute science. The law is nuanced. It, it, and we talked about that, right? Not guilty. It's nuanced, right? Everything about the law is nuanced and it's, and we're, and we're fallible people. Nobody's perfect. Nobody has perfect foresight about how, you know, um, ideals and understandings and public opinion and everything will change in the coming years. You know, the, the Dred Scott decision and looking at the 14th amendment and stuff to that effect, you, you, you have to wonder you know, does implicit bias also come into play? Do we all have do, have these discussion points? And I think it's great for us to laugh about it, right? Laugh about the better call Saul's and the right. horrible lawyers that we have out there. But we also have to realize that, you know, this is serious. This is for some people, you know, it's life or death for some. Because you know, here's my point. 
Yeah. You are going to go to a Christmas party later tonight. You yep. are going to go to maybe work tomorrow or the grocery store or whatever. Maybe you're going to go visit your neighbors. You're going to interact with people. Right. The Supreme Court, the, the, the politicians who pass these laws, by the way, think about that for just a minute. Do we not make fun of politicians? And are they Every not day. deserving of being made fun 100% of politicians? Deserving. Exactly. They're the ones who make our laws. So just keep right. that in mind. We're talking about the. A lot of people assume the law is perfect. It, 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 it's the answer to all the ills and ails of society. And this book kind of is gravitating towards this thought of, yeah, no, not really. Not really. <laughs> the, the law is made up of flawed people, flawed institutions. And I am going to suggest, Chris, there's a real freeing aspect to that. And here's what I'm saying. When okay. you go to I- interact with your fellow man, your, your, your fellow, uh, you know, your friend, your associates, yeah. whoever, the All person my down the street, your neighbor, how are you going to treat those people rigidly according to the dictates of the law or <laughs> under some other scale, some other um, you know, prism there besides the rigid application of the law? Hey, this is a great segue to... A recent case that is not covered in the book, we're going to cover it here in our podcast, Yeah, and that is this case this very last week. This was what happened here was a truck driver in Colorado, and I remember the story when it came out, uh, and I'll, I'll, let me just kind of set the stage here for the story, yeah. but there was this truck driver driving down I-70, and his brakes went out, and he's going downhill, and he's in a truck. And he can't stop. And for whatever reason, he's panicking. He doesn't know how to fix this situation. I think the testimony was he couldn't take those runaway off ramps to help slow up your truck. Or maybe he wasn't thinking fast enough to do that. Whatever. He plows into a traffic jam that was in front of him. I remember reading that. When it happened, thinking... That is horrendous. I mean, I can't imagine what those uh, people were thinking. All of a sudden, they're in a traffic jam. A big old rig plows into the back of them, causes four deaths in a fiery blaze. All right, so that's what the truck driver did. He was sentenced this last week to 110 years in jail. What What are your thoughts, Chris, on that that decision? It's horrible. Absolutely, absolutely horrible. Um. The 110 year prison sentence is based on a set of laws that I have always opposed as a criminal defense attorney, and that's the mandatory minimums and consecutive sentencing requirements. Now, for those at home, non lawyers, mandatory minimums and consecutive, mandatory consecutive sentences is a body of laws that require if certain people or if certain acts are found to be guilty, that you have to spend a X amount of time in prison for that act. It was very popular in the eighties and nineties when it came to the war on drugs is where we get most of it. Right now, Colorado had mandated consecutive terms. If you were found guilty of anything above murder two, which was manslaughter, intentional homicide, you were required to face consecutive, not concurrent in most places. They have concurrent life sentences. You were facing consecutive terms. So they stacked and that's what happened here. So here's the thought. If you go in, I think this actually was the, the genesis for this law, but if you go right. into some place like a school or, right. a, or a dance hall and you shoot up a bunch of people and you kill right. 10 people, you should not be allowed to serve those 10 life sentences concurrently. They should be stacked Correct. one on top of the other. Well, and most states and, have a like 25 to life sentence. So you are eligible for parole after 25 years. The thought was... Okay, if you kill 10 people in a dance hall, you get 250 years before you're eligible for parole. Right. And that's kind of the reason why you have this law. But here in this case, it sure seems like the law is reaching a perverted result because it is. And we talk about this in the book. What's the purpose of our of our penal system of our punishments? Is it to deter wrongful conduct? punish wrongful conduct, maybe allow for some rehabilitation. What actually is the purpose? I am going to suggest what this truck driver did is not that much different than what you and I have done behind the wheel of a car. I mean, he had no intent to kill anyone. He wasn't drinking and driving. His brakes failed as he's going down a mountain, driving a big rig. 
Right. That's not a, a someone who goes into some club and shoots up people. Exactly. And I mean, even by the DA, the prosecuting attorney's admission saying, look, it was a mistake. Series of bad mistakes. He, you know, he tried to swerve off the road, but didn't want to hit a parked semi for fear of a, a larger wreck. Missed the turn off to get off on the 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 hills, the speed reducing hills. The guy who's 26 years old just made a series of bad decisions that ended up in a car accident because of failed brakes, right? There's no malicious intent here. There's no going out and get hammered drunk or even in Colorado, everything's legal at this point, right? Marijuana is legal. He wasn't right. under the influence of anything. He was doing his job and his brakes failed, which is well, well outside of his control unless he crawled under his truck and cut his own brakes, which right, exactly. he didn't do. So even the, the DA is like, this is wrong. And the judge is also saying, this is wrong. And the pros and the defense attorney, obviously, this is wrong. But this is the law. And the law says you get to go to jail for 110 years, bro. So what is the, the what could happen here? Well, what could happen is the governor is mm -hmm. allowed to commute sentences. So here yes. I think there's going to be a, a, a plea made to the governor of Colorado saying in this particular situation, you got to show some clemency in some way. Because I just can't imagine a person driving a big rig whose brakes failed. Now, we're not saying that the outcome is not horrendous. It absolutely right. is a horrendous outcome. Four right. people lost their lives. Indeed. I'm just wondering, what's the point of, of taking this 26-year-old and throwing him behind bars for 110 years for this decision? Right. What What's the point there? There's, there is, and there's no deterrence. What's your deterrent? Oh, I hope my brakes never go out. Right. Um, Hope you make a better decision in the spur of the moment when right. things are happening very fast. You, right. you can't control that almost by definition. Exactly. It's there's no there's no answer in the law to to help to to deal with. Is there going to be punishment? Yeah, there's going to be punishment. You made bad decisions and four people lost their lives. But again, punishment to fit the crime. We should be allowing the court's discretion, and this is going to be my, my plug here, is that mandatory minimums and consecutive sentences is horrible. Put it in the hands of the judges. We have far more great judges than we do crappy judges that are just going to hand out lopsided um, you know, sentencing because they don't like the color of skin or they don't like the, right. the attitude or the crime that was committed or they have some personal vendetta. We have so many more amazing judges out there. We should be allowing these people that have become jurists that have been elected most often by the people to be a judge or appointed by an elected leader. Let them do their job. Let them right. review case by case basis. That's also why we have an appeals situation. If the trial judge jacked around and gave a harsh sentence to a kid because he was brown and gave a good sentence to a kid because he's white, let's take that up the appeal route. There's ethics. There's, you know, the Office of Professional Procedure. Like, there's all these things that protect us. We don't need mandatory minimum or consecutive mandatory to tie judges' hands for specifically cases like this. All right. Well said. We will continue to monitor that situation to see if that sentence is commuted in some way. Hey, before Hopefully. we get on to courtroom quarterback, where we can let it hang out and talk some football. Love it. Let's just give a quick update. Two other trials we have been following closely, the Maxwell trial and the Elizabeth Holmes trial, the billionaire for a minute trial. In <laughs> both of those cases, it is before the the um the jury, the yep. jury's deliberating right now as we speak. No verdicts yet. So we'll uh, once the, there is a verdict reached in either one of those cases, we will update you on what happens in those trials. All right, it's now time for courtroom quarterback. Cue the song. But let's talk a little football. Before we get there, actually, as part of talking about football, it has been suggested of recent, uh, 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 recently that because of COVID, a lot of games are being played by players the teams don't, the fans don't really recognize. They right. are signing players during that week just to feel the team. So the thought is, should fans get a refund because they are watching these games? They bought a ticket. Let's just say to watch Patrick Mahomes throw to Tyreek Hill Let's and Travis Kelsey. Well, guess what? This week, 
If you bought a ticket, you're going to see Patrick Mahomes throw to not Tyreek Hill nope. and not Travis Kelsey. They are both out due to COVID, right. uh, unless they get reinstated before the game starts. But nonetheless, uh, what do you think? How should the law work when it comes to the tickets you buy? When you buy a ticket to watch the Kansas City Chiefs play, what are you actually purchasing? You're purchasing the ability to sit in a seat and watch a football game. Doesn't matter who's on the field. Doesn't matter the the ticket back, which is essentially the contract that you buy into when you get. Well, I guess there's no right. ticket backs anymore because we don't do paper tickets. Good point. I guess it's in the fine print somewhere. The terms right. and conditions. Back but in my day, probably- kids, you got thin seats of paper <laughs> that were laminated that had ticket backs on them that had really, really, really small <laughs> writing that said you can't sue this the stadium if you trip and fall or you get food poisoning from the concession or that your favorite player doesn't make it on the field. Chris, I gotta say thank you. It was just yesterday. You had no idea, but just yesterday, I was asking myself. Okay, Joel, what other example is there that I am old? I, I come up with the oh yellow my gosh, pages, right? Oh, how yeah. how my son has no idea what the yellow pages are all about. <laughs> I also came up with a white Ford Bronco that he oh, has that this right? white Ford Bronco is lost on my twenty two year old son. Uh, what other examples could there be? You just pointed it out, the ticket back. Yeah. No one actually knows or sees a ticket back today. They're all electronic. Right. So it's all the the screen that you just scroll right by and not even read. Good point. Before right. your QR well, there code. actually is some precedent for this. Uh, there oh, yes. are three cases. I was gonna, I'm going to run by them real, real, real quickly here. But Meyer v. Bilicek, where a fan bought season tickets to watch uh, his team play. Well, Bill Bilicek there, the McCheater, was engaging in Spygate, <laughs> violating the rules right. of the NFL. And this fan said, look, I, I want a refund on my ticket. I paid to see a fairly fought game that right. was played according to the rules, and Bilicek was cheating. I want my money back. The second case was the Indy car race, where because the Goodyear tires had some problems, only six Indy cars were. We're going around the track. That's called qualifying. That's not called a race. But yeah. so some fans wanted their money back. Racing the is boring to begin was, with. Now it's even more boring. That? Racing is boring to begin with. Now it's even <laughs> more boring. Oh, what? You don't, you don't like the left turn circuit? It's oh, not look, like it. a left turn followed by a another left turn. left turn. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait. wait hold, Chris. Oh. Another left turn. Left hey, turning. this is compelling sport. <laughs> this is exactly, it's compelling sport. The third K, the third lawsuit was Mike Tyson with fought Evander Holyfield. Do you remember when this fight was happening? Yeah, I was like, oh man, I was like fourteen or fifteen, I think. I was a huge Mike Tyson fan. Well, apparently Mike Tyson during his training did not get enough to eat, was extra hungry during the boxing match, and bit off a part of Mike Ty- uh, of Evander Holyfield's Evander Holyfield. ear. Yeah. Yes. They obviously disqualified Mike Tyson. Stopped the match right there. A lot of people paid big money to buy these pay-per-views, and they sued. They wanted their money back. In all of these before-mentioned cases, the court said, eh, no, you're not getting your money nope. back. When you buy something, all you're buying is a, is a license to see whatever it is you are going to see. And if, if it's a sporting contest, so be it. If it's a hot dog eating contest, well, you know what? You got your money's worth. And so no breach of contract uh, for these cases. So I guess buy tickets in this COVID era. Mm-hmm. I guess it's buyer beware. Indeed. All right. That well, being hold, said. Real quick, though. My favorite part of the Holyfield Tyson thing, and I bring this up every time. Do you know what it was billed as? You know, like Thrilla in Manila and stuff like that. Right, right. The Holyfield what? Tyson was billed as the Sound and the Fury. <laughs> no way, really. It was that was the billing that was on <laughs> the that was on the the boxing posters that don't exist anymore that you would see painted like all around L.A. and all that right, stuff. Right, right. The Sound and the Fury, and he bit the dude's ear off. <laughs> no more sound for him. He cannot hear. <laughs> His ear has been bitten off. That is very, very ironic. Well, hey, we have COVID now, but I want to talk about the Chiefs. I, I, I you know, I know you're loving the Chiefs Cardinals right now, fan, and I'm trying to avoid the Cardinals because your team is in disarray. I, I is. you might not win another game this year. We're going to talk about the Cardinals here when it comes to my picks. I want to talk about the Chiefs. You remember a few weeks back in this podcast. 
everyone was saying the Chiefs are done. They are toast. What's wrong with the Chiefs? Do you remember, Chris, what my take was on that? I think you were almost giving up on the Chiefs, but you said they were a late season bloomer. I did not. That is heresy. Late season bloomers. Later in life. Yes, that's what I said. Late season bloomers. Exactly. It's exactly what I said there. Late season bloomers. I said, Coach Reed absolutely knows how to coach in December. He will figure this out. And by the end of the year, we will be on a roll. Well, Chris, guess what? It's the end of the year. And guess who's on a roll? It would be the the Kansas City Chiefs have won seven in a row and are now in first place in the AFC. How do them apples taste? Delicious because I also picked the Chiefs to be the AFC okay. champions. I had I I, I I will give you that I, I had doubt. Week five, I wavered. I wavered in week yes. five when the Chiefs couldn't get it together because I'm not a uh, diehard Hail Mary, you know, a Nomina Patre at right. Philly de, de Holmes sort of guy. Like, but they they're there. They're on their way back. They're hitting it up hard. Mm-hmm. Now I'm I, I'm not a theology major, but I, I did stay on Holiday Inn Express recently, and there was a Gideon Bible there in the room. I, love uh, it. I assume, anyways. Uh, but nonetheless, I think you know you had God's son, and I think maybe his maybe his third son was Patrick Mahomes. I'm not so sure on that. I hope I don't get struck down into a pillar of salt. I am just joking. <laughs> Kind of, but nonetheless, the bit. Chiefs are on a roll, and uh, yeah, we are going to be a force to be reckoned with. Here's my take on that, Chris. Take this to the bank. Are All you right. ready? I'm doing it. This is the NFL. This is December. January is coming. This yep. is when the pressure comes. This is what's going to separate the men from the boys. When you are picking your team, you got to ask yourself first, is this a game involving immense pressure? If it is, just know the Patrick Mahomes of this world, of this world they're going to show up time after mm-hmm. time after time. You can count on them to show up. The, oh, I don't know what quarterback you want to mention, the Matthew Staffords of this world. How <laughs> many playoff games has Matthew Stafford won? I don't know. I have to Google it. I'm going to go with zero. I'm going to let you Google it while I'm talking, but let me give you a quick little hint. It would be a goose egg. Yep. It, these are the, you'll, you'll find 12 of these in your carton with your for your <laughs> breakfast. A big goose egg. I think my son looked it up the other day. I think he's played in three playoff games, which, which shocked the heck out of me. I had no idea the Detroit Lions made the playoffs three times, but three losses. And so, it's uh, Detroit. Yeah, you, Come on. Exactly. They, they couldn't want a playoff if their drinking water depended on it. That's right. So uh, as you're making picks, as you're watching the NFL during this uh, end of the season, uh, coming to the playoffs, look for those who have been there before and done that. That's yep. why it's going to be so hard to go against Thomas Brady. Uh, oh, he has been is. there before. He has, I know he's old. I know he's grandpa um, in, in that later stages of life. Uh, but he's dinner, I think, at 445 at the Golden Corral. But th- that, besides <laughs> that, he has, he's been there. He, pressure will not get to him. Old age might, right? pressure Father will time. not. And so that's why your team there, I say your team, the Cardinals, your home team. I know they're not your favorite team. Right. But your home team, the Cardinals, might not win another game this year. That's they do not rough. like pressure. Last year, they started the year, I think, with maybe seven wins. I know it's an incredible yep. winning streak at the beginning of the year. Same as this year, and then they fell off of a cliff. These teams tend to follow these trends. And so nonetheless, with that being said, let's make our picks. What, what are your picks this week? Well, first, I got to do a me Coppola. Man, my picks last yes. week. My picks last week, Joel. Last what what <laughs> happened in football last week is absolutely unheard. Tom Brady, look, Father Time had the worst game of his career last week. Oh my goodness. Shut he out did, by the Saints. Did. And nobody was happier than Drew Brees up in that announcing booth being the only guy who was gonna pick the Saints over the Bucks. That's uh, that's uh, uh, not not the only one. That's go true. back and listen to my podcast. I know you uh, picked the Saints over the Bucks. Luckily, I did. I did not put that in my picks last week. <laughs> but it did dictate the rest of my week. Jacksonville, yes. or Houston beat Jacksonville. Detroit beat Arizona in that a one. mud 
Oh my god! Like I'm look, I'm coming out of church, and all of a sudden, I don't think God loves me anymore because the Detroit Lions are whooping up. Like, and I don't care that the 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 Cardinals lost. It's how they lost. It's by how much they lost. And then to have the Detroit Lions go on a press tour like they just won the Super Bowl because they beat the I don't know it's anger, anger, hey. angry eyes. Hey. I do not mean to pour salt into this wound, but I, I'm going to pour a little bit of salt into your Hit wound, me. and I hope we can still be friends after we'll I do this. Friends. But in preparation for this podcast, I had to re-listen to the last our picks from last week so I could record them gotcha. and then see how well we did. And so I was listening to you make your picks so last arrogant. week. So do you want me to give a quote, a word-for-word -word quote on what you said? Hit me. Hit me right in the chest. My stone... My stone cold lock for this week is going to be. <laughs> Do I need to say any more? Oh. Do you know where I'm going with that? Yeah, I feel it right, right here, right, just, just all in the fields, Joel. All, just all in the man. There's been things I've been wrong at, and there's been things I've sort of been wrong at, and then there's things I've been really, really wrong at. Man, that that's one of the ones that tops the list right there, being really, really, really wrong at. They, uh, yeah, the, hey, you know, who knew the Cardinals were going to fail? Right. I, th I, th I knew they are going to fail at the end of the year. Oh, yeah. But Detroit? Yep. Come on. No one saw that one coming. Yep. Oh, yeah. Well, and that All leads right. into my picks this week, right? Because I got Indy versus Arizona. Arizona's favored by one point. Indy is going to win. Okay, you're taking Indy. I'm taking Indy over, over Arizona. All right. I got gotcha. you. Um, Dallas and Washington, that's going to be – hopefully that's going to be my good easy pick for Dallas. They're favored by 11. All right, you're taking Dallas minus 11 over Washington. Yep. Oh, that's a risky one. All right, I gotcha. think it is. Uh, Rams at the Vikings. Rams um, are three-point favors, so I'm picking the Rams. Taking the Rams minus the three. Yep. All right. That's going to be a tough one, too. I know. But I'm, I'm hoping the Rams are going to start performing again because they're, again, remember, they're my pick. They're, it's a rams Chief Super Bowl. So I think the Rams have found their legs. They're playing better of late. They are. And you see that when you get a new quarterback, it, it just doesn't happen immediately where you turn into yep. this, this well, finely tuned machine. You are start. You are. You saw them start with a, the year with a bang, and then they struggled for a bit. Right. I like it when a team struggles because they find themselves, they find right. their identity, they find how to, they learn how to address adversity within a contest. And here, I think the Rams have learned about themselves. They figured things out. Now the coach knows a little bit about what um, Matthew Stafford can do. Here we got an OBJ here. Now he's kind of fitting and gelling into this offense. Mm -hmm. They are figuring themselves out. Here is the problem, Chris. The Vikings are figuring themselves out as well. Right. And Devin that's Cook why this is only... putting up some numbers. It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a rough one. That's why this is only three point spread. Right. The, the bet, the, the odds makers are saying this is going to be a close contest. And so you're telling me, I think you just told me that this is going to be a home game for the Vikings and the Rams are a three point favorite. That is going to be a game to watch. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be, and well, and it's Christmas. So of course we're going to be watching all the football. Oh, good. Good. So I got, Cleveland at Green Bay. Green Bay is favored by seven. Green Bay is going to win. They're on fire, right? Aaron Rodgers is absolutely blown up. Every MVP talk, they are connecting. You know, they're they're doing it. They went into Baltimore and just straight picked their pocket. And so we're going to go. Let me tell you why I stayed away from that game. I, I, I was that, that teased me for a little bit. I saw that game. I wanted to pick Green Bay. But here is another trend that you see at the end of the of the football season. All right. right. The teams that don't really have much to play for, they right. tend to not play that hard. They, they just let up. And so right. here, does Green Bay now say we have things locked up? Has their motivation waned just a little bit? They're, have they lost a little bit of their edge? They are playing a desperate Cleveland team who's, remember, they just lost a really close fight last week because they're starting two quarterbacks both their starter and their backup right. were out due to COVID. They will be back this week. And so might they be a little Ooh. bit fired up this week and say, hey, we got to make up for lost time, be extra on their on their game, their A game. I don't know. That game scares me. But it's another much-watched game oh, yeah. for this upcoming week. And then lastly, um, Miami versus the Saints. Yes, that's a good one. That's going to be such a fun game. Saints are favored 3.5. 
Yes. I'm going with Miami. Miami right. has won their last six games in a row. Miami is on fire. Do I think the Saints are fantastic? Absolutely. Do I think it's going to be another one of those fun to watch games? Absolutely. But you know what? I'm pulling for Miami right now. I want to see them do something. I want to see them come through. Wow. So now Miami, you know this, but the listeners might not know this. Miami start of the year one and seven. And right. people were saying, what is wrong? We thought this was a good coach. We thought they had a young quarterback mm-hmm. who is learning and they are one and seven. Do you know what the record is right now? Uh, I believe they're seven and seven right now. Seven and seven. They have won right. six in a row. That's one hot team. They have figured things out they there. Have. They're playing a Saints team who also has figured things out. They finally got their backup quarterback healthy. Their starting quarterback is out for the year, but they right. got their backup whose name is Hill. He's yep. kind of like this Tim Tebow-ish kind of quarterback where he's he's a runner and maybe a passer as well. But John Payton can work with him. And they kind of figured that out now. They, they actually can play well with Hill as their quarterback. I am really excited to watch this game. Miami won six in a row against the Saints, who are starting to figure things out themselves. That is really going to be a compelling uh, game. All right. Love so it. are those all your, That's your picks all I got. for this week? That's all I got. All right. My picks for this week. I, I, I will say that I got lucky last week. I don't know. Sometimes you feel it. And yep. sometimes you don't. Now, sometimes we feel it after the fact. We then go, okay, that's what we thought. But I've also had a uh, oh and five weeks. I was five and one last week, so I feel like I'm on cloud nine here. Uh, and so, I'm the 49ers and the Titans. The 49ers Ooh. are favored by three and a half over the home team Titans. I got to go with the Titans, and I don't know why. Uh-huh. I do not like their quarterback. Their quarterback is struggling. He is not winning right now. He's playing very mundane and below average. They've lost their starting running back, Trio Henry, for the season. It's a team in disarray, but they're only one game out from the, the top spot in the AFC. And so it's still a decent team. And this is a home game for the Titans. Their back is against the wall. If they're going to come out, this will be their week to do it. So I'm going to take the home dog, the Tennessee Titans. Good. All right, Colts versus Cardinals. I hate to do this because I feel <laughs> like I'm missing something here. I am taking the Colts uh, plus the one yep. uh, point over the Cardinals. I, the reason why I'm second guessing that is you also picked the Colts. So you and I are in agreement. And so when does that ever happen? The stars are aligned. And so yep. watch out, world. Something's crazy going to happen. Maybe Trump might actually apologize to Biden this week. <laughs> oh, no, that, 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 that's not going to happen. Nope, All not right. in a little bit. Ravens versus Cincinnati. Ooh, I struggled with this one because I, I, I like this game. This is a big time game. Both teams really need this to win. This will have the, the division title. Uh, it will be at stake here for this game with Cleveland as well. But these two teams are fighting it out. The Ravens are two and a half point underdogs. Cincinnati this is a home game for Cincinnati. Here's my thought. Cincinnati, this is the first time for them. Their coach, okay. this is, I think, his second or third year. He's yet to have success late in the season. Their quarterback is figuring things out, but hasn't quite figured him out totally. I'm going to go with the Ravens. The Ravens have been there before and done that. Uh, John Harbaugh is a good coach there late in the season. Yeah. He knows how to use a Lamar Alexander uh, effectively, and so I think they're going to run the ball quite a bit, dominate this game, and they're the underdogs. And so I get two and a half points, so I'm taking the Ravens over mm-hmm. plus the two and a half points over Cincinnati. Here's a big one. Bills and the Patriots. Oh, I was staying the away Bills, from that one. I know. I wanted to stay away, but that is such a big game. Uh, uh, the division is at, at the stake here. Mm-hmm. The Bills have been floundering. They have been struggling to find themselves. The Patriots just got beat last week, and so you know they're going to have a rebound game. I'm going against my hunch. I'm taking the Bills plus two and a half. Uh, I don't know why I'm doing that. I am just doing it. Uh, last two games here, the Broncos and Raiders. That's a pick them. It's even up game. And so I'm taking the home team, the Raiders. I think the Broncos are frauds. I think they've been frauds all year. (laughs) 
I, I, I know. So I'm going to go with the, the Raiders, the home team on that one. Finally, I t- I'm taking the Saints over the Dolphins. Uh, again, I think Saints are the home team. It's going to be fun excited to excited about that game. So and fun. I know you're picking Miami, and so we will be dueling each other out on that one. So those are my picks this week. Any final thoughts before we head on out and enjoy Christmas? Uh, just a reminder, all of our listeners, man, it's the Christmas season. Be kind to your neighbor. Show a little more patience when we're out and about. Don't hate retail workers. It's not their fault we waited to the last minute. You know, let's just right. let's just be out there and just be kind to one another. Just show a lot of love this season. We're all coming out of a, a pandemic, and we're all just trying to make the best of it. Thanks so much, man. Hey, it, it's now eight o'clock my time, seven o'clock your time. I promise you, I would let you go by this time. Yep. So hey, have a great week, and we'll see, have a merry Christmas, and we'll see you next week. Merry Christmas. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast. Please give us a five-star review. We need your love to help us continue highlighting the funnier side of the law. I want to give a special shout-out to our Vice President of Operations, Wendy Oster, without whom this entire operation would be a mess. Sean Wynn and 15.5 Features for making me sound way better than I actually do. Brooke Bolin for spreading the good word about us. And Ryan Kuhn and Paul Kuhn of Triplicity Marketing for our technical and computer support. Mm-hmm.